We are at a middle point and a hinge point in the season of Easter right now. Easter is seven weeks long, including the first Sunday of Easter, and then the eighth is Pentecost. And we're right here at the fourth Sunday, which is called Good Shepherd Sunday, because we always read a passage from that part of John's Gospel that talks about the Good Shepherd. But there's more involved in sort of the logic and the trajectory of the lectionary, which I think is actually really instructive for us. The first three weeks of the Easter season every year, we read accounts of the resurrection, all from Easter day and from that immediate time after when Jesus is appearing and he's walking through the walls of the upper room and he's, he's breathing the Holy Spirit upon his apostles. That's what we focus on for the first three weeks of the Easter season. And then after that, the church starts to change gears a little bit. And the readings start to focus more on preparing us for Pentecost. So we move from looking back to Easter to looking forward to Pentecost. And this is right at that hinge point when we start to look forward. Jesus gives us this image of the church, of his people, of his body, as the sheep who are in the sheepfold. They're his flock. They're the ones who listen to his voice. Uh, who follow him along the way, and he is himself the good shepherd who leads us. But when we understand this gospel as part of this preparation for Pentecost, to be sent out on mission, like the apostles, like Peter that we hear in this first reading, to preach the good news, this image of the sheepfold starts to take a little bit different shape. Because it's true, right? We are the sheep of his flock that he has called, and we strive to listen to his voice. But he also tells us in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 10, 16, he says, Behold, I send you out like sheep among wolves. So we're sheep. Okay, fine. I mean, I don't think sheep had the pejorative thing back in the day like it does now. It's not nice to call people sheep. Um, That's not what I mean. But we are totally dependent on the Good Shepherd, and we want to be with him in the the sort of safety of the sheepfold, but there's also this element of he is preparing to send us out on mission without changing us from sheep. We're still going to be sheep when he sends us out on mission, but now we're going to be unprotected in the midst of wolves. In that same passage in Matthew 10, He goes on to say, basically, expect persecutions, and they're going to haul you before the tribunals and the law courts, and you're not going to know what to say. You're not going to feel prepared. You're not really going to be prepared, but it will be the Holy Spirit who speaks through you at that moment. You won't feel prepared. You'll feel like you've been sent out as a sheep among wolves without protection, without armor, without weaponry. I don't know. Um... But he's saying, even if you feel unequipped for this mission, you won't be, because you will have the power of the Holy Spirit, who through your humility and your weakness, through your being unequipped, or at least seemingly so, the power of God will become that much more manifest through you. So Jesus tells us what's going to happen here. And we have that liturgically, right? If this is that hinge point where we start looking forward towards Pentecost, in the next two weeks after this, we start looking at those, gosp- uh, those readings from the Gospel of John where Jesus says, you are a branch and I am the vine and you have to be grafted onto me and take your life from me and dwell with me, otherwise you have no life. He's insisting on the importance if we are to be sent out Our only effectiveness and power for this mission is rooted in him. It's to dwell in him. We may be sent out like sheep, but the good shepherd will be there with us. Then on the ascension, Jesus gives us our great commission. He says, all right, you have dwelt all this time with me. You have seen what has happened. You have seen me go to the grave and then the strength and the power of the love of God 
burst even the bonds of the grave. You have received this gift and will receive it in more abundance of the Holy Spirit. And now I'm commanding you to go out to the ends of the earth and to spread the gospel. This is not something that's just for people like me who wear the, wear the funny clothes. This is, for, this is for everybody. And I think there can be a real hesitancy uh, in us when we hear these passages. We might be tempted just to, to skip over them and be like, not for me. I don't even know what being on mission could look like. Where am I supposed to go? Who am I supposed to talk to? What am I supposed to say? I'm not prepared. I think that's a lot of our response. I know it was for me back when I first started practicing my faith a lot more when I had a big reversion and came back in college. Um, I had this desire to stay together with Christ and to be formed by Him and to learn everything I could about the church and about the faith and basically to, to live in the church was my desire and that sort of led me into seminary so I pretty much can now. Um, I think that's a really good, that's a really important desire to stay close to Christ, to learn from Him, to listen to His voice, to become teachable so that we can hear and be convicted by and be transformed by His Word. But that desire cannot be to the exclusion of being willing to be sent out. And when we are sent out on mission, we're not going to feel prepared for it. Jesus tells us that. I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. You're not going to know what to say. But it's going to be okay because I'll be there with you. And in that moment, I will speak through you. In that moment, I will use you as an instrument for the spread of my gospel. That's what he says to us. And he backs it up over and over and over. It just takes this sort of great act of faith on our part to believe that he actually wants to do it through us, through you and you and you and you. And the thing is, like, he kind of makes it dependent on all of us as well. We, we each have relationships with people in our lives that are more of a relationship of trust and intimacy than maybe anyone else has with them. And it might be precisely from someone like us that the Word of God is able to be proclaimed to them in such a way that they hear it. It might need to be in your voice and not mine or not our bishop's or not somebody else's voice, but your specific voice. And so that's what all this stuff starts to prepare us for, is the realization that God is actually calling and equipping each of us to be leaders, uh, to be sheep who are also in some way shepherds, or at least they're missionary sheep, <laughs> sheep sent to rescue the lost sheep. That's what we're called to be, all by the power of the good shepherd. And so... This week begins kind of the first week of a three-week series that we're going to do on Christian leadership. Uh, this week we're focusing on the aspect of being teachable. Next week we're going to look at how a leader needs to be available, right? If we're not available to be sent from the sheepfold out to speak the Word of God, if we're not willing and available to have these conversations with people, we're not going to be able to be the missionaries Christ is calling us to be. And then the third week is about the contagion, it's a bad word right now, but the contagious quality of the joy of the gospel that a Christian leader needs to have. So it's T, teachable, A, available, C, contagious, T, A, C, or TAC, or whatever you want to call it. We're going to talk about that for the next two weeks to prepare ourselves to receive this great commission from the Lord on the ascension, and then to receive this super abundant power and goodness and guidance of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost to be sent out, even if it's like sheep among wolves. So our practice this week is to focus in on that aspect of teachability. If I am to be 
like a sheep among wolves, vulnerable and only strong insofar as the Lord himself is my guide. I need to be attentive to his voice. I need to be docile to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I need to be immersed in the word of God and allow him to teach me um, in preparation and in the moment. There's a couple different ways that we can bring this down to a very concrete practice. You can find it as always, we we print the practice of the week in the bulletin with a little reflection. Um, And so you can find more examples there, but just some of them, like many of you are involved in ministries here and some some of you in leadership capacities in those ministries, whether it's a connect group or you're helping with alpha or you're helping with lectors or or greeting or, or whatever, like there's so many different ways that you all are involved and to some degree or another also in leadership in this parish, it can be helpful to ask those around you how you're doing <laughs> to give you feedback. Our seminarian Greg Scatini is finishing up his pastoral year and he just had the wonderful experience of having to ask everybody on the staff, and everybody that he worked with closely and a lot of parishioners who were very sort of close as as almost mentors for him this year, he had to get formal feedback from them and listen to their constructive criticism. And to his credit, he really took it very well. He was eager to learn from that criticism. It can be so valuable for us to be teachable in that way. to hear feedback from others on how we're doing and to actually take that to heart. So if you can find a way to imitate that a little bit, I'm sure if you ask anyone in your family, like your spouse or your kids, they will be more than willing to give you plenty of feedback on how you're manifesting these qualities of a leader and of a good shepherd and and all the things. But there's another way too that we can develop this, this virtue of humility and of, of docility, of teachability. And it's to look at the way Christ speaks through his, ter- his church, to look at the teachings of the church. There is in this imagery in our gospel of Christ the good shepherd, he's not making that image up just ad hoc. He's drawing on a lot of really powerful imagery from the Old Testament, in particular from Ezekiel 34 and from Psalm 23, where God himself promises that he will shepherd his people. That's the imagery Christ is drawing on. And in Psalm 23, there's a really important just sort of geographical context. Psalm 23 is, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. By restful waters he leads me. He revives my soul. I said something wrong in there, but y'all can fact check me on it. That psalm has its context in the land of Israel. That may sound obvious. But one of my teachers one time pointed out that the desert and sort of the, the wilderness that a shepherd would have to guide the sheep through in the land of Israel is not the same kind of thing as what desert in our mind might bring up. It's not a sand desert with rolling dunes like in Lawrence of Arabia or the Jordanian or the Syrian deserts. It's much more like like the hard pan of Texas, like almost a rock desert. And so if you imagine a shepherd leading his sheep through that kind of terrain, sort of this rocky, like hard-packed clay, During the daytime, the sheep are able to see him, and so they can follow in that way. And we know that they recognize his voice, so they can follow in that way. But at nighttime, there's another way that they follow him as well. The shepherd has the rod, the crook, and as he walks, that rod is tapping on that rock desert. Because it's a rock desert, you can hear it, this tap, tap, tap of the shepherd's rod which even in Psalm 23, the psalmist says, that gives me comfort. I know that you're here because I can hear even through this indirect way, not your voice directly, but I know that your presence is here with me through this indirect tapping of the shepherd's rod. For us in a spiritual sense, 
I think that means the way Christ speaks through his church, right? He speak, the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart in prayer. It moves us by grace. But God also speaks through his body and through the apostles and their successors whom he's given the authority. He speaks to us in the liturgy as well. When the church's ministers solemnly proclaim the words of the scriptures and of the liturgy, it is Christ who speaks through all those things to us in this indirect way. He can also speak to us through the other members of his body when they offer maybe constructive <laughs> feedback or criticism that we might call fraternal correction done in charity. God can speak to us. He can teach us in all sorts of indirect ways that are like that shepherd's crook tapping on that rock desert in the land of Israel. Your rod and your crook guide me. And so, to bring it back to the practice, another practice that we can take on this week is to look into what the church teaches. There's sometimes when we can struggle with something the church might teach, or we would prefer just to rather kind of leave it over there and not grapple with it head on. If we want to dwell together with Christ, if we want to have him and the power of his Holy Spirit protecting and guiding and leading us as we're sent on mission, we need to be fully in conformity also with his teaching and with his truth, which is proclaimed through the church. And so the practice then would be to inform yourself about that teaching, to go and to look up the catechism online or to actually get the book, that'd be even better, but you can find it online or to go to a place like Catholic Answers or to take some aspect that you know that you might not be fully informed on or that you might even have a struggle with and to not be afraid of that but to go sort of boldly and with humility out to let yourself be taught by the words of Christ speaking through his church, to train yourself in this virtue, which prepares us to be sent out, whether we like it or not, like sheep among wolves, guided and taught by the Holy Spirit.